How far do you think we're going to range in, in which directions uh, today, Joseph? Well, I'm thinking about checking out some areas, you know, 20, 30 miles south of the park. Hitting some of the spots that are good for telemetry, but also giving you a chance to see some roads that maybe you've never been on. We're in Pinnacles National Park, about an hour and a half drive from San Jose. It's a dramatic landscape and an excellent place to see California condors. In the 1980s, only 22 California condors were left in the world. Amid great controversy, those 22 birds were captured and bred in captivity. Over time, the plan worked. Today, more than 300 California condors soar over Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah, as well as California. The species is back from the brink of extinction. And humans are still working to make sure they stay safe. All of the adult birds are fitted with ID tags and radio transmitters. Some have GPS transmitters as well. Here at Pinnacles, conservation biologist Joseph Belli is a volunteer monitoring their movements outside the park. Twice a week for the past 11 years, he's spent a day driving nearby roads, frequently stopping at high points to wave his antenna. That's what we do. We uh, pick a spot and we go through the entire flock, about 85 birds. And each bird has a number. What, what's it sound like? Some sound like beeps, okay. and others sound like an electronic sneeze. If a condor's transmitter hasn't moved in a while, it beeps or sneezes in double time. That could mean a dropped transmitter or a dead battery, or it could mean the bird's in trouble. Either way, Belli alerts the park to investigate. We find our first condors without the aid of the radio receiver, right above the Pinnacle Store parking lot. There's three birds up there. Oh, and that's 931. I can read the wing tag. And two birds above it. Are they all condors? Yep. With wingspans of nine and a half feet, these birds are huge, the largest land birds in North America. Just standing in the parking lot, we spot seven in half an hour. Billy gets signals from a dozen or more. The rocks for which the park was named provide plenty of suitable nesting and roosting habitat. There are untold number of cavities there that could serve as condor nests. Condors don't seem to fear humans. Billy had a number of close encounters. You can be up in the high peaks and you can be sitting down on a rock, and if a condor wants to fly right past you 15 feet away, it will. You get a bird with a nine and a half foot wingspan flying 15 feet away from you. If you don't react to that viscerally, I don't know that you're human. Billy grew up in the Diablo Range foothills east of San Jose, and later bought a house deeper in the range where his closest neighbor lives half a mile away. He spent years doing wildlife research in Henry Coe State Park and wrote a master's thesis on western pond turtles. His first book, The Diablo Diary, is a lively collection of essays about the creatures and controversies of the range. A second book about condors is nearly complete. Our car contains another notable nature pro, Seth Adams. He's an expert on the 25-mile-long northern end of the Diablo Range, which runs through the Bay Area. Belli's focused on the more isolated, 175-mile-long central and southern parts of the range, which Adams believes are mysterious, enticing, and vital for the range's ecological health. After reading Belli's book, Adams was eager to meet him. Their first face-to-face -face conversation took place at Belli's kitchen table and lasted seven hours. Now they get together regularly to look for unusual Diablo Range wildlife. On one recent trip, Adams encountered his first San Joaquin kit fox. On another, 
They drove deep into the night and found kangaroo rats, antelope squirrels, and blunt-nosed leopard lizards. Adams calls their excursions up and down the Diablo Range after botanist William Brewer's famous book of the 1860s. They've started posting their insights on Diablo Range Revealed, a blog hosted by the conservation organization Save Mount Diablo, where Adams has worked for more than 35 years. Adams and Belli are odd in similar ways. They both share a lifelong fascination with endangered species, and they're willing to endure heat, cold, hard hikes, and bumpy roads to find them. A night drive looking for tiger salamanders in the rain is their idea of a good time. Physically and temperamentally, though, they're different. Belli is of average size, Adams is big and muscular. Belli is mild-mannered and polite. Adams is brash and full of prickly questions. Belli answers each one patiently. What's your relationship with the birds? Are you a babysitter? Something kind of like a babysitter to a degree. Somebody that's trying to keep an eye on them and, and look for anything that's worth noting. Are these your children? Is this your family? I've always tried to see myself as just a conservation biologist. If one dies, you're not going to be but, destroyed? I mean, some of these birds I've been tracking for 11 years now. And they may not give a rat's ass about me, but after a while, you know, you get one of those birds that dies that you've known, you've trapped, you've held them in your arms at times. And it's really hard not to get discouraged when one of those birds dies. As much as California condors have rebounded since the 1980s, they're still not secure. Lead poisoning is the number one cause of death. California banned lead ammunition in condor country in 2008 and throughout the state in 2019. But non-lead ammunition has been hard to find, especially during the pandemic, and people are still learning about the need to use it. So condors continue to ingest lead in carrion. Other threats include power lines, which can electrocute condors, and microtrash, such as plastic, broken glass, bottle caps, and can tabs, which kill condors when ingested in large quantities. They still need captive breeding to keep their numbers up. Extinction has really been averted. If we can breed enough condors, the, the challenge now is keeping them alive in the wild. That's a, that's a tougher nut to crack. about an hour at Pinnacles, we head south and east. There's lots to see in every direction, with scenery straight out of the Wild West. We see big swaths of a shrub that dominates the chaparral, up north, chamise. But here, chamise stands beside desert sentinels like yucca. Tule elk roam the ridges. Some of the valleys are lined with trees got a uh, nice riparian forest here of willows and cottonwoods. Have you ever seen a condor in this area? Yeah, they, they fly over here quite a bit. Occasionally they'll, they'll be down here on the flats feeding. So we're only about five, six miles east of the park and it's not at all unusual for them to hang out above here and to the east. Pinnacles and two sites closer to the coast are release sites for condors bred in captivity at zoos and other facilities around the West. They come to these sites at age 18 months. They climatize in an outdoor pen for another two months or so, and then are released to the wild. At that point, they're free to roam, but the Pinnacles flock tends to stay right around Pinnacles. They undoubtedly like the good habitat and free food the park puts out to trap them for biennial health checks. But their allegiance to the park may also have to do with what Belli calls condor culture. I really believe, because the birds are so social, they kind of hang out where other birds hang out. If you get a few birds here, you're going to get more, you know, if it's one of those things. Back on our tour, we start seeing other birds that are unusual for us, including the yellow-billed magpie and... Roadrunner. 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 
At one point, we passed close to four eagles standing in the dirt. Two are golden eagles and two are bald eagles. It's always exciting to see one eagle of either species, and here are four just casually hanging out. Does that happen so. very often? Around here it does. Yeah. At another stop, we walk over a bridge to study a pitifully small creek winding through a baked brown landscape. A small pair of eyes peers up through the duckweed. Then we look harder. Frogs have wiggled out of the muck, and Bella declares they are foothill yellow-legged frogs, an endangered species. He wonders if this could be the first sighting of the species in watersheds just east of the Salinas Valley. To me, this is like seeing a hundred condors. When Belli checks later, he finds we're not the first. Foothill yellow-legged frogs were recorded at this same spot in 2018, so that's a disappointment. But Belli recovers gracefully. Let's say it was like seeing 10 condors, he says. What's the most important bird you've ever done something with? And I would probably have to say two birds, I, I, I can't just say one. One is 340. He claimed this territory around 2013 or so, and I think he's sired three or four chicks now. And if there was a patriarch or a dominant bird in Pinnacles, I would say that he would be one. Now, there's another bird, 330, similar age bird. He's taken a different tack. He was released in 05 or 06. Instead of hanging around the park, he, he went outside the park. Our goal is to trap each bird up to two times a year for physical health checks. Well, from 2010 to 2016, we didn't catch him. But we finally trapped him in 2016. We put a GPS on him, and we could see he wasn't hanging out in the park. He wasn't far, but he would very rarely come back to the park. Adams, of course, would love to have condors come back to the northern part of the Diablo Range. For years I've been telling people that if we pr protected enough land around Mount Diablo and made sure it stayed connected to the Diablo Range, that eventually California condors would come back. We had brought peregrine falcons back, golden eagles were doing pretty well, um, and, and protect enough habitat and California condors would come back. Adams' statement was the buildup to an announcement Bill I made at the same event. And in the past, we've had birds fly up as far north as the outskirts of Livermore, but they never went as far as Altamont Pass. Well, a couple of weeks ago, one of our young birds, 828, uh, went beyond Altamont Pass, went to uh, Morgan Territory, Round Valley, flew around just east of Mount Diablo for about an hour or two, and then headed back down south. Suddenly, 828 became a big deal in the Bay Area. She'd already been celebrated locally as the first Pinnacles chick fledged in the wild. Now she's the first condor to be recorded in Contra Costa County for more than 100 years. Even the media has taken note. So north and south, the Diablo Range is connected. The condors are showing us what's in one part can enrich the other, which is why Adams wants to see as much as he can. Our tour route parallels the San Andreas Fault, the junction between the Pacific and North American geologic plates. Pancho Rico Canyon to the west of us is surprisingly precipitous, probably thanks to the dynamism of the fault. Wow. I can't think of another place around here that's quite like that. I mean, nobody at Pinnacles is aware of this. Forgotten landscape. We're also near Parkfield, California, where U.S. Geological Survey scientists study earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault. Suddenly, Adams pulls out his phone and dictates a text message to some colleagues at work. San Andreas Fault, National Monument. I ask for clarification. Let me introduce you to the San Andreas <laughs> Fault National Monument. 
How could you not want to preserve the most distinctive feature of the entire state? Visible from space. Adams is having fun with us. The private land around us is unlikely to become a national monument anytime soon. But he's dead serious about defending this place. And the rest of the Diablo range from the fragmentation that could come from proposals for new dams, reservoirs, off-highway vehicle parks, and housing developments. The organization Adams works for, Save Mount Diablo, has helped add more than 110,000 acres of protected open space to the northern part of the range. Now, it's extending its gaze southward to include seven of the 12 counties in the Diablo Range, including San Benito, where we are today. Toward afternoon, I noticed that we haven't actually seen any condors since the Pinnacles parking lot. But that's okay. I'm more than satisfied with Belli's stories and the surprising sights we've seen. I asked Adams for his assessment. What's an up and down the Diablo range trip meant to accomplish? Is it just for fun? Obviously not. It's for exciting the imagination.